Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with the last living U.S. triple ace fighter pilot from World War II, Clarence E. Bud Anderson. Bud, who celebrated his 100th birthday on January 13, 2022, began his fascination with airplanes after hearing about Charles Lindbergh's famous flight across the Atlantic Ocean in 1927. As a boy in rural California, Bud spent hours with a friend watching biplanes take off and land at a local airstrip. Bud's love of airplanes eventually led him to join the U.S. Army Aviation Cadet Program on his 20th birthday, one month after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the United States entry into World War II. After receiving his wings, Bud entered the war in Europe as a fighter pilot. From November 1943 through January 1945, Bud flew 116 combat missions in his P-51 Mustang, which he nicknamed Old Crow, and was credited with destroying 16 and a quarter enemy aircraft. Bud will be sharing with us stories from his life and 30-year career in the U.S. Army Air Corps and U.S. Air Force, which will include vivid accounts of aerial combat against the German Luftwaffe, his combat tour in Vietnam, and his friendship with a German fighter pilot, which developed many years after World War II. I'd now like to welcome Colonel Bud Anderson to our show. Welcome, Bud. Hey, thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm very proud to have you on this show because I've read a lot about you and the amazing life that you have had and the great accomplishments that you've made for this country. And thank you again for all of your service over a 30-year military career. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to start off by asking you, where were you born and raised? And what are some of your earliest memories? Well, I was born in Oakland, California. But that was just a matter of convenience. Uh, There was no hospital up here. And my grandmother was in Oakland, so my mom went there for her children. And, uh, but I was raised on a farm about seven miles from here, Auburn, where I went to high school, and uh, three miles from Newcastle. And that was my home of record. We had a P.O. box there but I never lived in town. Okay. So you were a farm boy. Did you have a lot of chores to do? Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Every day, in season or out of season, uh, you had milk the cows, clean the chicken house, and uh, help out around around the farm. What are some of your earliest memories, bud? Well, I remember when our airmail plane crashed near our home. And that was pretty exciting. We had to run over there and check the wreck, you know, before they removed it. So was that your first introduction to seeing or knowing anything about airplanes? No, not really. I had a buddy in Loomis, and we were both real hot about airplanes. And the mail planes used to fly over our house on their way to from Reno to Sacramento to San Francisco. The parents would take us to the airport if we were in the vicinity and leave us there. Just dump us off in the morning and go pick us up in the afternoon. (laughs) You were kept busy the whole day then. Yeah. Oh, wow. I think I read in your book that you had heard or you remembered hearing about Charles Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic. You remember that? Yeah, that was probably my, well, one of my inspirations. I bet. And tell us a little bit about your mom and dad. What were they like? 
Ed was a farmer and a Swede, and uh, mom pretty well, pretty well raised us, I think. She was very nice. But when there was any punishment <laughs> to be rendered, the dad did it. Right. Didn't your dad take you up? Uh, didn't he go up with you in an airplane when you were a boy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was that like? Oh, man. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And you, you think about it. He had no interest in airplanes. He was he was being good to encourage my uh, my dreams. And so we went down there. We got into a early biplane, open cockpit, two in the front, pilot in the back. And we took off near North Sacramento and came up and flew over the farm. <laughs> it was incredible. It was just mind-boggling for me. Your heart must have been pounding out of your chest, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it would be. So you started to take an interest in flying, and you had a friend also that two of you were rather interested in flying. Was his name Jack? Yeah. Tell us about him. He lived in, in Loomis, and I think our parents became friends, and then that's the way I met Jack. And then we became uh, best buddies. Well, we joined the Boy Scouts in his town because, you know, I was out in the country and there was none of that out there. Then we went to high school. He was one year behind me, but he was the guy mom and dad would uh, dump us off at the airport, <laughs> two of us. And we'd keep a log book of what flew over the house, time, you know, and direction. And, and we would compare notes, you know, see if you saw the same ones I saw, because they were right in line for with Sacramento. Uh, we had a lot of adventures. And then I went off to junior college to get my two years in so I could join the uh, Army Air Corps aviation cadet program and jack was right behind me yeah when you were in uh, junior college and you were getting your when you say you're getting your two years in at this point did you have aspirations to be a pilot in the military yeah i wanted to fly and uh you know mom and dad didn't have any money to pay for this foolishness of <laughs> airplanes and so I thought, well, you know, I looked up the military requirements for both the Navy and the Army, and they were pretty much the same. You had to be 20 years old, have two years of college, and be physically fit and unmarried. So, and then when I went to uh, college, my second year, they had a wonderful program, a government program where I could fly pretty much for nothing. I got a private pilot's license for the price of $9.50 for an insurance policy for my parents. That's a bargain, bud. Yeah, that's pretty Yeah, I got a private pilot's license. You, you went to, I think it was, you had to have 35 hours and you got tested and you either passed or failed. And I think that was pretty much the end of it. You had your pilot's license. And you, how old were you? Were you 19 at this point? 19, yes. So you still were one year away, one more birthday away from being able to actually become a pilot in the military. And you yeah. were waiting for that day to come. Now, let's talk about dates right now. What year were you born, bud? 22. 22. 22. Okay, so if I if I add nineteen to nineteen twenty two, we're in nineteen forty one. So we both know what happened on December seventh, nineteen forty one. Where were you when you first heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and how did that impact you? Well, I was at the two year course in the college, trained me as a side benefit 
I could be an aircraft mechanic. So uh, the Sacramento Air Depot was um, building up and they were hiring anybody that could turn a wrench. <laughs> so I went to work there and worked on the graveyard shift all summer and they just put me on days. And I can remember we were working 24 seven. The foreman came around. He says, hey, you, 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 Bud Anderson, go home and come back at midnight. Uh, Japanese just attacked us at Pearl Harbor. Hell, I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. But I realized that pretty much meant that if I did sign up, I would be off to war. And so I was 19 and I turned 20 in, uh, it was December 7th, December 7th. And so uh, January 13th, I went to the recruiting office right on the base and signed up. And a few days later, I was on my way. When you heard the news about Pearl Harbor, were you scared? Were you excited? How, how exactly did it make you feel? I guess all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> World War II had already started. I remember watching the newsreels of, you know, the Battle of Britain and all that. So I knew about that part. But then the Japanese doing this uh, surprise attack and then joining in on, the, you know, the Hitler getting together. World War II against the Allies. All right. So now you you sign up. You you turn twenty in January. So just a little over a month after Pearl Harbor was bombed, you enlisted. Uh, where did you go for training? Well, I made a short trip to uh, Arizona to uh, Higley Field, later Williams Air Force Base. Uh, there we got our clothes and our shots and uh, learned our left foot from our right foot. <laughs> <laughs> and I was only there about a month, then uh, went to San Diego, California for a primary. They had a primary school, a basic school, and an advanced school. They were trying to train as many pilots as possible in those days. And they were hiring, uh, letting flight schools, you know, if they were good, train the military pilots, civilian instructors. And so I went to the Ryan School of Aeronautics in San Diego and flew the Ryan PT-22 open cockpit, no radio. And we flew out of uh, Lindbergh Field, which was a international airport, I guess. And so we'd fly in the morning and go back and do academics in the afternoon. And another bunch of pilots would go out in the afternoon and fly. After about uh, three months, we uh, went to Bakersfield, California, 400 miles closer to home. <laughs> so you're really close to home all this time. This is, that's pretty good, huh? And I was thinking, God, I really want to see the world, you know? And I thought I'd go to Texas or Florida, somewhere. So uh, basic school, we flew the uh, consolidated BT-13. That was a little more advanced. Uh, we had a canopy at least. <laughs> right, right. What kind of planes were these? Training planes. Just trainers. training planes. Okay. Yeah. BT was basic trainer. PT was a primary trainer. And we had a radio. We started night flying, instrument flying in the back. But it still had a fixed gear and a two-position prop. It was pretty simple. From there, we went to Arizona to uh, Luke Field. And that's Luke Air Force Base now today. 
uh, September 29th, 1942, uh, we graduated. Oh, back, I want to talk a little bit about trying to train these 250,000 pilots as fast as possible and don't let safety get in the way of progress. It's kind of a sad uh, statistic. We killed more people in training than we lost in the war. Really? Yeah. Oh, my. So they really did throw safety to the wind, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's sad. Okay, so now we're at Loop Field, um, advanced training. Pretty much go over the same stuff we did at uh, Mentor Field and Bakersfield. Mm-hmm. And there we had Army instructors, and the same at Luke. And 29th September, we, we got our wings. We graduated there. In those days, they needed pilots everywhere. Instructors, bomber pilots, cargo pilots, fighter pilots, you name it. They needed them, needed them badly. So if you could not convince your instructor you'd be a pretty good uh, pilot, you could get what you wanted. I wanted to be a fighter pilot now. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from, but probably uh, watching the uh, Battle of Britain uh, newsreels and things. But on the other hand, I thought the, the fighters were a little cooler, you know. And I also thought if I got in a single engine fighter, I would be the pilot, the navigator, the radio man, uh, the gunner, the bombardier, and I'd be responsible for my life. And I felt that that would would be better than being on a crew where you, you know, and maybe had 10 guys you had to depend on. Fighters were cooler anyway. (laughs) Well, yeah, very, very dashing. My mom was born in London. She grew up in London. When the war started, she was only 16. They sent her out to the country. She joined the Royal Air Force at age 18. But she always used to say how dashing the fighter pilots were, particularly the Americans. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they had a saying over there, the Americans are, they're overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I remember hearing that one. Definitely. So so now you're training, you're pointing towards uh, being a fighter pilot. How long was it before you actually went over to Europe? Well, I didn't leave until, see, that was 42. I got checked out in a P-39 at a um, fighter pilot replacement pilot training group. And you went in there and got checked out on P-39. And then after about three or four months, you went somewhere and fought the war. When my time came up to go, they said, no, you're not going. You're going to go to Tonopah, Nevada, and you're going to join the 357th fighter group that's been activated for World War II. Uh, we'll be the first members ever in the fighter group. And I didn't realize the importance of this thing. It put me in a position of leadership because we're going to get new pilots right out of flying school, check them out, and we're going to train as a fighter group and then go overseas and fight the war Mm -hmm. as a group. It's the best way to do it because you knew all the guys, knew how they flew, and you could recognize their voice over the radio and you know you were together trained together so I would at least be a flight leader and that was important because I would be the guy that needed to find the enemy and uh, and go get them so bud not only are you the only person on your crew as far as in your plane you're responsible for for everything about that plane. Plus you were also now a leader of the group you were with that people were looking to you for leadership. So that's a, that's a lot to, 
to put on a 20 year old. Yeah. When I think of it, you know, yeah. was it frightening as well as exciting or what? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of enjoyed it. Before we get you over to actually into Europe, I want to just for myself, also for our listeners, can you explain, at least generally speaking, what was the role of the fighter plane, the fighter pilot? What was your job considered to be? Well, they were used in air defense. They were used as uh, air to ground support the troops and then also escort bombers. And what I've read about bomber pilots and bomber crews that it was an ex extremely, all, all of those jobs were dangerous, but the bombers were particularly susceptible because they were the, they were the bullseye for the enemy. The, the enemy wanted to take them out. Is that, is that your understanding? Sure. Yeah. And I, I heard that we lost a lot of bombers in World War II. Oh, yeah. Well, they lost so many. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. The bombers, the B-17s, B-24s, they thought that they could go unescorted and they could go wipe out the enemy's um, war-making capability and the troops could just walk in. Well, they forgot to tell the Luftwaffe about it. <laughs> yeah. They uh, started in 42 and then 43, about the time we were going over. They had a shutdown of the bombers. They quit, hauled it. They were taking too many losses, unacceptable losses. Mm -hmm. But uh, they decided they had to have fighters. They had fighters over there, but they didn't have the range to go where they wanted P-47s and uh, P-38s. So the first Pioneer Mustang group with the uh, B model with the Rolls Royce engine was stationed in England, assigned to the 9th Air Force. And the 9th Air Force it was going to be a ground support of the troops after they invaded Europe. Mm -hmm. They were building up and they didn't have anything to do, so to speak. And so they said, well, let's try these Mustangs. We understand they are. They got a lot longer range and endurance and, and might be the answer. They should have been assigned to them in the first place. Right, right. Uh, brilliant planning. Uh, so the 354th group uh, was loaned to the 8th Air Force, and they were so wildly successful that the 8th Air Force demanded that they get the Mustangs. So who was the next unit? Uh, the 357th Air Fighter Group. And we were also assigned to the 9th Air Force, but we were just getting there and getting on our base and gradually getting our airplanes. That's an interesting thing. We learned we're getting the uh, P-51 as we were going overseas. And we'd never seen one, let alone fly one. Oh, it's gonna be brand new to you then. Yeah. And so we had to do it yourself, or check out. And the handbooks didn't even come with the airplanes. Oh no, really? Yeah. Oh, so when you first sat in the cockpit of a P-51 Mustang, what was the experience like for you, bud? Well. Uh, we didn't care. We heard they were a great airplane. So and as soon as we flew it, we knew it was better than the P-39s. It was just like night and day. And so we were eager, you know, to get checked out and uh, learn how to fly. So that leads me to another story. A lot of guys still only got one or two flights, then phew, you're in the combat. Hmm. It sounds bad, but we had a lot of flying experience. You know, we had several hundred hours. I think I was approaching 900 hours. Then the 
group commander said, Anderson, you're going to go to the Royal Air Force Central Gunnery School. And instead of flying Spitfires, you take a Mustang to the school. So, wow, I got 35 hours in the airplane before combat. Well, that was good. It was an advantage, right? Yeah. So back to the tactics and the bomber concept about this stuff. So they finally got fighters and the 8th Air Force had a bomber command and a fighter command. But we were run by bomber pilots. So, and they told us how to escort. They said, we want to see you. We want you close. And when the enemy comes in, you drive them away, then come back and escort. And we had a, actually had an altitude. If we went through 18,000 feet, we had to break it off and go back up and escort, close escort. So uh, General Arnold was very unhappy with the 8th Air Force and the 8th Bomber Command. Their mission was to destroy the Luftwaffe, number one so that they could have the invasion on schedule. It was scheduled for June the 44. And here it was, uh, late 43, and they, the Luftwaffe was very powerful. They were pretty strong still. You're saying is uh, Hap Arnold wanted to reduce them so that they wouldn't be a threat during the D-Day invasion. Yeah. The Luftwaffe could have probably prevented the... Uh, invasion yeah so um uh, there was a lot of hard feelings about it and general arnold finally fired the head of the eighth air force and he sent general doolittle over there he says now jimmy you get over there and you got to get rid of the loop so he got over there and he had you know he he was a bomber pilot, a fighter pilot, and set records in the airplanes. And he, uh, he had different philosophy. And he says, uh, okay, guys, from now on, when you are escorting and you engage the enemy, you stay with them, take them to the ground and kill them. And no more 18,000 feet. And he turned the fighter pilots loose. Mm. I never saw such an eager bunch of guys. I bet. We felt like we'd had our hand tied behind our back. And sure enough, the spring of uh, 1944, Four. Yeah, we defeated the Luftwaffe. And what they had been doing was bombing their airfields, bombing the factories, bombing all the stuff that the fighter, fighter, fighters used. And they were just, just ineffective. And I remember reading a uh, intelligence report in January of '41, and they were, actually had uh, plenty of airplanes and plenty of pilots. Then I read another one in um, January of '42, and they still had plenty of airplanes but they didn't have pilots. They did not have a good replacement pilot program. They thought they could conquer Europe and that would be the end of it. And so by then the fighting is over Germany, their hometown, home country. And so it was a little harder to do training because uh, allies were over Germany. Right, yeah, the, the yeah. war was being taken to them. So my first few flights were uh, under those uh, close escort rules. And I think his rules became effective in March. I didn't know this, but I read this in, a, in some of his books after the war. And it said that he went to the fighter command, went down to visit him the first time. And walks in and he sees this big sign over the door, you know, 
the mission of the Eighth Fighter Command is to bring the bombers home safely. And he talks, asked General uh, Kepner, what is that? Who put that up there? He says, I don't know. It was up there when I came here. So he says, change it. Tear that thing down. Mission of the Eighth Fighter Command is to destroy the Luftwaffe. That's when it went there. It was pursue and destroy. That was the concept. It worked. It worked because the Luftwaffe was not much of, of much consequence to the D-Day invasion. They didn't really, they weren't a real presence, were they? No. And... We had killed their experienced uh, pilots. That's what did it. Yeah. But I have to ask you this. So I'm looking at your statistics. You flew between November 1943 and January 45. You flew 116 combat missions. You had 16 and a quarter enemy planes destroyed. This is so impressive to me. You're called a triple ace of World War II. Can you tell our listeners, what does it mean to be a triple ace? Well, an ace is uh, somebody that shot down five enemy airplanes in aerial combat. And they got 16, so that's uh, three times. Yeah. But can you tell us about the very first time that you downed an enemy aircraft? <laughs> That's, that's, that's kind of a humorous thing. We started flying, and the first guy in the squadron got probably a guy we thought was uh, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, got the first kill in the squadron. I said, oh, crap. God, I haven't even got one yet, you know, and I chased him and, and broke off, go back up, you know. So finally, uh, we had a relay system then. The P-47s would take them in and then come, P-38s would uh, come and bring them out, you know, way back though. And the Mustangs would go in and join the bombers, relieve the other fighters. And we'd take them through the target and back, and then they'd get it, relieve us again. So... Uh, we just got relieved and we're on the way home. I'm leading a, a flight of three or four and another flight came up and joined us. And it was a flight from a different squadron. And so I'm leading this pack of, I guess, seven or eight airplanes back. And uh, we dropped down to about 25,000 and we're heading home. And I see up ahead, I see a B-17 lower than we are. And he's smoking badly. And I think he had one feather. So I say, hey, you guys, let's go over there and uh, take this guy out to the water. So just as I get going, over, fighter pilots can't talk without using your hands. No. <laughs> That's okay. Use them. <laughs> The bombers down here, and we're we're on our way over towards it. Over here, three uh, ME 109s bellied up to us, are turning in and diving down towards it, making an attack on the B 17s. All right, guys, one of those, I'm leading this mess here. One of those is mine. So we cut them off the pass and uh, and I got into a circling dogfight with this guy at uh, a fairly low altitude. He was coming at me at a very steep angle, and I was coming at him at a very steep angle. And so finally I said, I knew how to shoot. I'd been through three gunnery schools, and I shot quail as a kid. You know, here he is, 90 degrees out there or less, you want to fire generally in a 10 degree cone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way you can get them. Six o'clock, right dead, dead stern was the best way. But I couldn't get there. And so I said, here he is coming. I'm going to just pull my nose through him. 
and I will not be able to see him because he'll be underneath me. And I'll pull out here, estimate my lead, fire a burst, and hope that he flies through it, gets hit. So next time comes around, sure enough, I smoothly pull it through, line him up, pull it right here, and fire a burst. And when he comes out, He's smoking cool it. And uh, pretty soon it's black. <laughs> and so, God, hot dog, I got him. He pulls up like this and bails out. Hot dog, I got him. I got my first kill. And then I, I'm flying along. And all of a sudden, I sensed that there was somebody out there. Oh, good God, this guy was sitting right on my wing. And he was down low and he had his mask off. I mean, just open. And he was grinning and he made a sign like that. And I thought, God, it was Johnny England, uh, England Air Force Base in Louisiana, the guy it was named after. And uh, he had a couple of kills already. And I thought, God darn, did he shoot that thing down out from under me, you know? I knew I had a lucky shot. I hadn't really seen it until, you know, he came out. So I still got a couple hours to go home. By the time I got home, I kind of talked myself out of it and said, I'll bet you he shot that thing down. And I said, not very sportsmanlike, but there's a war going on, I guess, you know. So uh, we get home and I asked my wingman, did I get that guy here? He said, I don't know. He says, I was out of position when you guys were doing that. And uh, I didn't really see it. I saw him bail out, but uh, I filled out a claim, gave it to the intelligence officer. If I said, hold it, I got to go talk to a guy and get confirmation from John England, the other squadron there, 62nd squadron. Now I'm going to go, I'm on the way over there to the club. We go to the club afterwards. Everybody gets to be talking all over, you know, with the other guys. Now, how am I going to do this? Am I going to, you know, say, hey, you asshole, did you shoot that thing down out from under me? Or <laughs> how are you going to bring it up and be uh, cool about it? So, um I walk in the club and go to the bar, and he sees me, and he comes running over to me. He says, Andy, that shot that you had out there, that's the best shot I've ever seen. You got that sucker about 60 degrees angle off. I said, oh, Johnny, you know, lucky shot. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> yeah. Then I run over to the phone just as soon as we're through and claim my first kill. Now, that was a proud moment for you, huh? <laughs> and you had another uh, 15 and a quarter kills after that. 16. Yeah, well, was, yeah okay, it was a, a total of 16 and a quarter. That was your first one. So, yeah. Just for clarification, when you say kill, it means that you shot a plane down. It, uh, sometimes aerial the, combat. Aerial combat. Uh, sometimes the pilot, enemy pilot, ejected and got out, but uh, sometimes not, I would imagine. Yeah, you're right. A lot of them bailed out. They bailed out quick. Now, you never had to bail out of a plane, did you? No. Uh, just a couple other things about your World War II combat career. First of all, I understand that you named your plane Old Crow. Can you tell us where that came from? Yeah, that always comes up. <laughs> So I tell uh, my non-drinking friends, my Baptist friends, that it's named after the most intelligent bird that flies in the sky, the crow. And that's true. The crow is a really canny bird. But my drinking buddies all know it's named after that Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. <laughs> oh, that's terrific. It's a lousy whiskey. It's a lot. <laughs> it was a great plane, though. Yeah, it had something to do with flying and something to do with combat. You know, yeah, that it did. That it did. 
Bud, if you could single out one incident or time during your missions in Europe in 43 through 45, can you single out one time where you were the most frightened or where you had the closest call? You know, I want to talk a little bit about uh, combat. You know, of course, you're, you know, it's hell, you might get killed in this thing. There is that fear. And before you get into combat, you see, you hear some contrails and they're heading for, you know, your area. You're down here and they're way up over here. Uh, your apprehension, you get a little bit of fear there. But in my case, and I've heard other guys say this too, when I was actually in the combat, you know, one versus one, look across that circle, and you could see the pilot, you know, a little black thing in the cockpit. I was not afraid. I was so pumped up with adrenaline, so engaged, you know, trying to save my life and trying to sh shoot him down. He's trying to kill me, so. I was not afraid. I think I was just, it was just, uh, you were just so eager and so, so pumped up about it that I was not afraid. It's a weird, weird thing. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. So your adrenaline just took over. Yeah. Your adrenaline and your training. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. The more experience you have, and once you get experience, and then once you get successful, it's, I would hate to say this, but it was, um, it was adventurous. <laughs> it was, uh, hmm. I enjoyed it. I'll tell you that. But what would you say was your most memorable combat experience while you were in Europe? Best combat story is a time when uh, we got attacked by four ME-109s while we were doing close escort. We still would put fighters at the bombers because that's where the, that's the bait. But it allowed us to go also to roam around and uh, find these big formations of German fighters and break them up before they could get to the bombers. See, that was the effective thing of uh, General Doolittle. General Doolittle and the P-51 had a great impact on the war in Europe. And he's my hero. Well, anyway, we've been attacked and uh, they're up here. And so they're coming into our five o'clock position. We're very vulnerable. So I rack it up into a very tight turn and we go head on with them. And neither one of us could shoot. And they were in string formation. And when I made that violent turn, it put my guys in string formation. So here, here we are. I think I look over and when they pass, I look back and they turn into a left circle. They want to fight. They're not going after the bombers. And so we're circling there. And there we're up at uh, 30,000. The Mustang can definitely outperform the, uh, their best G models. You could see it was a G because it had a big bulge out here on the left side of the engine. And so we went around three times and we're gaining on them each time. And they rolled out and headed back into Germany in level flight. They didn't dive. Then finally, uh, the number four guy climbs. He breaks away and climbs, but going the same way. So I can uh, okay, I sent my uh, number three man and his wingman. I said, you go get him and we'll follow the, the three. So he did. He shot him down later and joined us later. Now we got two must Mustangs and three ME-109s. Well, remember what I said, the best thing to do is get for six o'clock. Yep, six o'clock. 300 yards fire. That's what I did on the 
number three guy. And he did something that was crazy. He was smoking, so he was hip. And he rolls it over, inverted. And I don't know whether he was trying to get out of the airplane and get, or he was thought if I rolled over, I'd fall out of it. Or I have no idea what he was doing. But here he is jammed up against the top of the canopy. I wonder if he wasn't having some trouble trying to bail out. Mm -hmm. But he's uh, very uncomfortable up here. And so I just drove in a little closer and gave him some more shot, hit him all over the place. And black smoke came out and he fell out. So I got two more up ahead. So I let him go. He shut down. And uh, these two guys are kind of skidding around looking behind. I didn't realize how bad the M109 was trying to look back until I saw one after the war it was on display in, L in Los Angeles. And I, I said, let me get in that thing. And so I got in, Jesus, I had a heavy, heavy canopy. And that thing was clanking down and God, you feel like you're in a coffin. And you, your head bangs up right here. You can't get it around to, to look behind you. How did that feel, Bud, to be sitting in the plane that you were seeking to shoot down? Yeah. <laughs> that well, must have been pretty I'd cool. I'd known what I'd known before, how bad it was. But anyway, they're doing this. They're probably talking. And maybe this guy back here is saying, hey, I'm getting shot, you know. So one of them rolls over and the other one makes a climbing hard left turn. Well, I, I came across his path almost 90 degrees because we were chasing him and I had a lot of speed, but I couldn't make that turn. That was just too difficult. It was a 90 degree turn without losing all my energy, pull it to idle, drop flaps. I probably could have got inside of him. But so anyway, I cross his flight path, I'm not close to him, but just his flight path. And then I pull up slowly, steeply, very, you know, not to lose my energy, but a nice, smooth, pretty fast pull up. So now I'm above him. He's out here where he made his hard turn. He reverses his uh, flight path and tries to come up underneath me. That's no fun. I did like the idea of him being down there. But he can't. He has to get out here and, and lead me, and he can't. We're both coming up at about the same rate, and he's out of range. So I see him slide over to, the, to my right rear. So he's going after my wingman who was coming up behind me. And so I said, John, you better take it down and go into some pretty good evasive maneuvers. And so John broke it off. And sure enough, the ME-109 dropped off on his. Well, then that put me right on his tail. So he sees that and he straightens out and he comes around this hard turn again. So I do the same thing, pull up. Sure enough, he reverses and tries to come after me. So I said, oh boy, this is a little different. He, he's after me, so we're, we're going up and up and up. And he stalled first. And I has to drop off and I'm back on his tail again. I don't really like being out in front of him. And the next time it was a little bit different angle. It wasn't quite the 90 degree flight path. It was probably 60. I said, I'm going to see if I can't get inside of him and uh, get him on the climb. So I start pulling it in. It looks like, oh, wow, I think I'm going to be able to make it. He sees that. And he straightens out and he tries to out climb me now doing what I did to him, but I got the better airplane. 
So I pulled up here at a really steep angle, but uh, no, a steep climb, but it's, I got the angle down underneath the 10 degrees, fired a little burst, saw a little tracer go by the right wing, gave it a little bit of rudder, plow, I caught him right in the center of the airplane, uh, cockpit engine and uh, all around. And then I quit shooting and shot up right alongside of him in formation with him. And uh, he was rolling like that. Uh, but I glanced in the cockpit before, full of smoke. Mm. And he went from there. He just rolled, slowly rolled. And then he came on down, 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 vertical dive down, and I'm vertical dive down behind him. And he is really going past and straight, just straight, fast dive. And pretty soon I saw his shadow. He had a smoke, it was probably a thousand feet long, black smoke, vertical dive. He's leaving up. Tremendous smoke. He's over here, but the shadow's over here, you know. Mm. Pretty soon I saw he and his shadow meet and blew up. Just tremendous explosion. I mean, it was incredible. Best combat experience I had. Most successful. You know, they attacked us. We turned the tables on them and shot three out of the four down. Well, that's amazing. Not only your instincts were in place, but your adrenaline was keeping you sharp as well. And there's not much time for thinking, isn't it? It almost becomes more of an instinct thing, right, bud? That's part of it. You got to do it by instinct. You know, mm. you can't sit there and say, oh, gee, what do I do? You know, I'm, he's going he's this way and that. You got to know what the next step is. Or you're going to be the one that's going towards the ground yourself if you you take too much time to think of what you're going to do next. Yeah. Bud, you talked about your friend Jack before from your hometown area and that you both went into the service. Could you tell about what actually happened with Jack and how you met your wife, Ella? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, Jack and I, we, were in, we both, all three of us went to the same high school. She and Jack were one class behind me. I'd been out with them, you know, maybe once, but uh, things change, you know. Here he has a girlfriend and uh, he's spending more time with her. <laughs> I can't blame him. And he, he joined the service just like I did. He went and got it two years of college and then went on flight train. Well, just before he went overseas, they got married. They spent about a week together. And he's off to the war and she goes home. Jack was shot down when I was crossing the Atlantic. Oh. I didn't know about it until I got a letter from my sister that told me about it, that Jack was missing in action. And that really affected me. Yeah. I was going to go over and meet him, you know, at his base as soon as I got over there. But I didn't get that opportunity. And then I thought about her. So when I had went home on my R&R, &R, they'd gotten the word that he'd been killed. Got it on a telegram that came. Mm. What a way to... Awful. They don't do that now, but during the war, there were so many of them that they couldn't send people. In. And they were only married about a week, you said, when he left? Uh, yeah. And so uh, when I go home on my 30-day uh, R&R, &R, first thing I got to do is go see her and offer my condolence, at least. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> no. But... I got my guts up and went to see her. After I came home, I got that wasn't so bad. So I went to see her again and again and again. <laughs> and then uh, 
when I was going back, uh, we agreed, let's keep in touch, you know, write letters. So uh, when I came home, I didn't know I was getting married. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> told you. <laughs> <laughs> but I came home on the 1st of February, and we were married on the 23rd. Pretty fast romance. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that's terrific and we were married for 70 years 70 years she was a good gal i'm sure she was and you're a good guy bud <laughs> well <laughs> i think she was the one that had to put up with the, all the drinking and uh, all the hooting and hollering <laughs> Bud, you were 30 years total in the military. I understand that you continued to serve. You were a test pilot. You also flew in Vietnam. What was your role in Vietnam? I was the wing commander of a F-105 wing. Had three uh, strike thuds to fly. And we had two um, wild weasels. Two squadrons and wild weasel, the two seaters with the uh, anti radar missile. And uh, it was late in war. I had been assigned to the Pentagon and I hated that. So they came around and said, Colonel's assignment said, Hey, uh, bud, there's a wing commander's job in uh, Vietnam. You don't have to go, but we thought we'd offer it to you. They want to have a guy that has already commanded a wing and was checked out on that equipment. And so I had that in spades and I was combat ready, checked out. That's how I got there. And it was late in the war. And so I only flew about a half a tour. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, send the thuds home. And so uh, we sent the three strike squadrons home and then reassigned the uh, wild weasel airplanes to uh, Karat to the other base. But did I hear or do I understand that you and your son Jim actually flew together in Vietnam? Yeah. Can you just tell us about that? Yeah. If some pilot came and told me his dad was in the theater and they wanted to fly a combat mission with I would say you're crazy. Yeah, no, right? No. Absolutely no. You know, if you're gonna take a risk of killing one of you, you know, what impact that'll have on a family. Hmm. Or both of you. Both. So Jim gets there ahead of me. He's he's already in Vietnam. And I followed him shortly thereafter. I'm in Thailand. He's in uh, Benoit in South Vietnam. He's in a special ops squadron. Mm -hmm. And that means they do all kinds of things with the O2 Cessna 337 twin engine push pull. One of their missions is to uh, drop leaflets over the uh, communist strongholds. They might have AK-47s, you know, but they don't have weapons, big weapons, so that the little Cessna can get down at a safe altitude. And they have uh, broadcasters and uh, big speakers out on each wingtip. They go around and broadcast uh, propaganda to them in their language. And then when you're through with that, you come back and drop leaflets down that give you safe passage. They call them surrender leaflets, but they don't <laughs> like the word uh, surrender. No. Uh, so then uh, I get a call from um, headquarters that I'm to go to 7th Air Force headquarters, which is in Saigon, right next to Benoit, uh, for a big commander's conference. All the wing commanders have to come and we have to be there for two or three days. And uh, then I called Jim and I said, hey, uh, we might be able to get together uh, if I'm there that long. 
And while we're talking, he's saying, hey, why don't we fly a combat mission together here with me in the O2? And I says, your commander, I want to prove that. He says, stand by. And he's still a new guy, you know. And he come back in about 15 minutes. He says, here, Dad, it's all set. You come down a day ahead, land at Benoit, his base. Next day, we'll fly a combat mission and spend one more day at night together. And then we'll fly you over for your meeting. So it happened. And I fly in, land at Benoit, leave the F-105 over there. He says, I'll come over and pick you up in the morning. We'll fly a combat mission, land at Benoit, and uh, spend the night together. So uh, it it happens. I land, spend the night in Saigon, and then the next morning, the person comes in, and we get in the airplane. Normally, he takes a, a second crew member. But on these kind of flights, it's usually a buck sergeant, three striper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and here's a bird colonel as this kicker, you know. <laughs> we get out there and uh, we find out it's uh, in the country, South Vietnam. And we go around and do all this broadcasting. We could see them down there with their AK 47s shooting at us. But. Uh, They've been operating there for so long. They know what to do. They can go right to exact altitude where, you know, the KK-47 craps out. So we're not in any real danger. There's a problem, you know, maybe they might bring in an anti-aircraft. Sure, sure. You don't know. So uh, we get through. He says, okay, Dad, get in the back and open those little bomb doors we have back there. And... and, uh, Dump the uh, boxes full of uh, propaganda, uh, surrender leaflets uh, out. So I give it in the back, and I got a flight suit on. You know, it has zippers up here. It's on a slant, and I had my favorite uh, stainless steel knife in there, it's engraved. I take it out, and I cut the boxes open, and, and I close it and put it back in here. And I open this thing up and grab it handfuls of these things and I bend over you know and over the bump doors and, and dump them out while well, my knife went right oh you lost mouth. it I forgot to zip it up <laughs> that was my big contribution to the war effort I just I dropped a stainless steel knife on them <laughs> but, oh boy I wonder if it did any damage down there <laughs> it probably rusted all the way through, <laughs> sitting out in the jungle. All right, but did Ella ever find out about that? They took a picture of uh, Jim and I doing that. And uh, damned if somebody didn't put it in the Air Force Association magazine. Oh, no. There was a little squawking about it. Too. I would think. Um, <laughs> from my commanders, you know, they said, Dammy, you know, you're a bird colonel. You should have known better than that lieutenant colonel down there running that special op squadron. But it, it nobody really, I, I certainly would, wouldn't have approved of it. Now, I like to finish this story with, you know, flying with your son and on a combat mission is... Uh, you know, pretty special thing. I don't really have any words for it. I can't, I don't have any, I can't explain it in words how I feel. But my wife sure had some words about it. <laughs> she said she damn glad she didn't know about it until it was over. <laughs> yeah, she would have thrown you out of an airplane, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's incredible. Your son, Jim, did I understand that he is named after somebody that you knew? I named him after uh, two guys, James Browning and Edward Simpson. 
So he's James Edward Anderson. Two guys you flew with in Europe? Yeah, they were both killed. Well, I've spoken with your son, Jim, and he is a really interesting guy to speak with. And uh, he helped me get in touch with you, which is terrific. I do have to ask you about somebody by the name of Gunther Rawl. Yeah. You, he was a German pilot during World War II, and he was your enemy during World War II, but you two actually became friends. Could you tell us something about that? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't walk across the street to meet a German pilot after the war. This didn't interest me at all. And I've been to a lot of symposiums where they had three or four German pilots and the same number of us. Yeah. And we'd get up there and talk. Then I met Gunther and he came over early and I was I was gonna to go to these same symposium symposiums. And it was down in Alabama, and we were hosted by a guy who was owned a lumber business, a tree cutting, and he had an airfield. He had a strip on his property, and he had a lake. I came down a little early, and he got there a little early to get settled. We were going to be, you know, Monday, we were going to go to the Air University and do our thing. So uh, we're a guest of this uh, guy with this big spread. <laughs> and I said, well, Gunther, let's, let's go fish. You know, it's a big lake out there. So they got a boat. And, you know, we didn't have anything to do with, but talk. So I got, to, I got to know him pretty good. And, and he could talk about Hitler. You know, I asked him that, you know, did he ever met Hitler? And he said twice. And he said the first time, he said, God, he said, I came away. And I said, boy, this guy has really got it. You know, he is really something. He knows what's going on. And he's uh, charismatic. And uh, I don't know, just really impressed with him, he says. And then he went back to Russia and flew combat. They all get the Iron Cross, but you get the Iron Cross with the diamonds. And there's there's different levels of it. Right. So each time you got this number one and number two uh, award, you got a personal. You met uh, Hitler with the, with some other guy, maybe too. But... Right. And so the second time he got, oh, he'd been shot down and not shot down. He had a belly land. He broke his back, went back to uh, Germany, the you know, hospital, and he met his future wife. Well, married her, I think. Yeah, they married. And that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he married and then he, they said he would never fly again, never get back on combat. Good God, let alone fly. Well, they found a doc that would uh, cooperate with him, and he found some buddies, you know, that would get him some flights. And so he flew, got back on flight status, and he went back to combat. And then he got this big award, and he went back to Germany, Hitler again, and he went back and told his wife, he says, we've lost the war. He said, Hitler's just a blithering idiot. He doesn't know what's going on. Just a blank, empty coat, you know. Then he told me another story. He says, when he went to the Battle of Britain, he said, I'm, I'm flying. I got these four guys with me, and we're flying out. And we're climbing out towards Germany. We see all these contrails up there waiting for us. He says, uh, I got a guy in the back. He says, on the radio, he says, oh, yeah, my oxygen's uh, not working properly. I've got to go back or I have to abort. He says, you have those kind of guys in your outfit too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had one or two. <laughs> But then I realized 
that this guy is a warrior. He's not a Nazi. He didn't join the party or anything. And another kind of interesting thing, his wife was a nurse in the hospitals, you know, and they had a lot of Jewish doctors. Well, they, they were keeping them there because they were doctors and they needed doctors. So I guess they were putting up with them at the time. But uh, she was helping them escape. She was. Yeah. And the uh, Gestapo got onto it. And so Gehring, the chief of the Air Force, got Gunther aside and told him about this. He says, Gunther, this is a serious problem. You know, we're screwing around with the Gestapo now. And a little bit of it might be out of my hand here, you know. But he was a national hero. I guess they decided that they couldn't just overlook it because he was a national. They didn't want to court martial him. So it went for a little while. And then uh, Gary had another meeting with him. He says, You know, that problem we had, it's gone away. Don't worry about it anymore. That's incredible when you think of atrocities. And even when I think of Rommel, you know, being sort of forced to either commit suicide or something worse would happen. And the fact that Gunther Rall was able to get this swept under the carpet, I guess, yeah. is incredible. They, they must have really been interested in preserving Rawls, you know, status. Wow, what a cre- incredible story. Yeah. So if you could go back into a time machine, get into a time machine right now, and go back to sometime during your time in Europe, in World War II, and you could meet somebody for a cup of coffee for an hour and just talk, who would that be? And what do you think you would ask them? Eddie Simpson or Jim Browning. (laughs) And if, if you could have coffee with both of them, what do you think you'd ask them? Well, I would, I would just be overjoyed to see them alive again. I'd tell them about my son. <laughs> and we'd probably talk about the war. They would probably have more questions than I would. Mm. <laughs> well, that's, I'm sure that they would be honored that you named your son after both of them. Yeah. One last question, bud. How do you feel your time in combat in Europe during World War II impacted the person you are today? Oh, I think it had a tremendous uh, impact. Even like today, I'm the uh, America's highest scoring living ace. And I'm not sure there's any other triple aces ones that had 15 kills alive. I'm not the highest scoring ace. I'm just the highest scoring live ace. And uh, I get a lot of, well, requests for (laughs) Zooms. (laughs) Interviews, yes. (laughs) And uh, yeah, people treat me well. Well, you're a true hero. But, and I also know that you're a member of the Aviation Hall of Fame. And you have written a book called To Fly and Fight Memoirs of a Triple Ace. And you've got a website. I think your son Jim was instrumental in putting it together to flyandfight.com. People can find more out about your book from that website and all the things that have been going on in your life, including your. 100th birthday celebration in okay. January of this year, 2022. Can you just say a couple words about what that celebration was like for you? Oh, it was great because they wouldn't tell me what they had in mind, but my kids put it together and they had uh, about 200 invited people. And then we got the two Mustangs, uh, two old crows there and had it in a hangar, a friend of mine's hangar. It was warm enough, good day that they could open the hangar doors. 
and we got the lady from uh, the Wings Cafe, which is a big favorite there on the field. She serves good food and a lot of food. We had a master of ceremony who's uh, one of the world's leading uh, acrobatic pilots, uh, Sean Tucker. He's just a live wire, you know, and uh, so much energy. He just, <laughs> I don't know where he gets his energy, but he just puts himself into it, you know. And then they had a well done video, kind of my life, life story. And they showed that on a big screen. Then they had selected people come up and talk with me. The whole thing kind of was overwhelming. I'm sure it was, bud. But it sounds like you had a really great time. I got to tell you how I found out about you, bud. I interviewed Jana Hoppus Doolittle, Jimmy Doolittle's oh, granddaughter, mm -hmm. about her grandpa and just sounded like such a wonderful man. And when I was finished interviewing her, she said, there's somebody I think you'd really like to speak with. His name is Bud Anderson, <laughs> and he's a triple A's from World War II. She said, I'll, I'll reach out to his son, Jim, and see if that's possible. And I heard back from Jim, and uh, he helped make this happen. So I'm just really honored to be able to speak with you. And your memory is incredible. You've you remember all the details of dog fights that you had more than 70 years ago, 77 years ago. And that's just great. And your story is one that um, the fact that you're able to, to go around and willing to go around telling your story for enthusiasts, for historians uh, is great. So I, I'm so glad that you're doing it. I hope you continue to do it. Do you have any plans uh, this year for, for doing more? like speaking or anything like that? Well, we are planning on going to Oshkosh for sure. And then probably the Fighter Aces reunion. Those are the two things. There'll be other air shows. The Truckee Air Show happens right there, so I can go to that too. So far, that's all we've got lined up. Well, Bud, thank you again for everything. And I hope that you know the, that you have a really good 2022. And I urge people to go to your website to flyandfight.com because there's actually the video that was shown at your birthday is posted to that website. Yeah. It'll take hours to go through that website. It's terrific. And I hope you have a great day. Okay. All right, Bud, thank you. God bless. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.